Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I feel that I haven't gotten so much attention already at the start of the talk, <laughs> but uh, so I'm grateful. Um, so what uh, I'd like to start with is what I call very pompously the axioms of security and human usable security. Uh, and then uh, say a few words about the client side irrelevance of past security architectures. Um, and I'm reflecting here to some extent uh, some of the ideas that a number of people have had over the years, not just mine. Uh, and then mention a few things about trustworthy spaces uh, for operating systems and applications uh, that have very simple and understandable security properties and that are stable. In other words, the spaces don't change, they have to be almost as immutable as hardware. And finally, the focus of the talk, which is the last 15 minutes, unfortunately, you have to put up with the rest of 45, uh, is trustworthy communication among these partitions that we are talking about. And what I want to emphasize is that trustworthy communication is a lot more than just secure crypto channels. And in fact, we have to focus a lot on the human in that area. Okay, uh, so with that, uh, axiom number one is that there will always be bugs and operator errors that would lead to security vulnerabilities. And what I mean by always is uh, about 15 plus years, uh, because that would obviously put the date past my retirement <laughs> time, so you won't catch me <laughs> to disprove my axiom. Uh, but anyway, I, I really believe this is true, and I, unfortunately I'm not the only one. And in particular, not only will have the security vulnerabilities forever, but there will always be adversaries willing to exploit those vulnerabilities. So whoever thinks that they are going to solve the malware problem or the insider attack problem should probably rethink their hypothesis. Uh, this is not something that we can solve. So somehow we have to learn to live comfortably with malware and, and intruder attacks. Um, second axiom is that uh, there will always be rapid innovation in information technology. Uh, and basically, this is we are told by people who know that, that we are living through this information technology revolution, which is somewhat akin to the industrial revolution. So we we'll lived with that for a long time, and our lifetimes are probably going to span another, you know, 50 years or so, depending upon how old are you at this point. And the information technology innovation would actually last at least that much. Now, one of the things that this does, this rapid innovation part, is that it forces competition, which also forces us to use components uh, of uh, software systems and even hardware systems of very diverse provenance in the supply chain, which means that we have, will have non-uniform assurances within the same uh, application and uh, basically we'll introduce more attack services. So imagine an application that's made up of three or four internal components uh, which are independently usable. Well, if you start scanning the uh, object code, you are starting seeing the interfaces of the applications which were used internally. And if those applications you find through experimentation, they are flawed, then this entire application that you now are using is going to be flawed. So increase the tax surfaces. So basically, uh, one of the things that, that has also happened is that we have insufficient, insufficiently stable configuration for what we call the trusted base. This is somewhat independent. Basically, what we call the trusted base has been growing and shrinking and growing even more. And consequently, whatever assurances we have rapidly become obsolete. Okay. So this shows that we are really living in a fairly complex world. To make it worse, the last axiom says that, uh, that uh, only giant survives. Giants survive. Basically, there will always be large, complex systems whose security is not fully understood by most users. <laughs> and uh, I don't see this changing, and uh, neither the people who actually suggested this first and in fact, Bartle Lampson suggested it about 10 years ago uh, by observing the industry for, for a long time. And consequently, this is going to be a source, a major source of our problem. Users 
do not understand and cannot be expected to understand this very large complex system with intricate security uh, characteristics. Okay, what about, um, what about usable security? So the first thing is the simpler the better. We all know that, but we don't really exercise it in, in a lot of our research and certainly not in a lot of the products that you see. So uh, this is not a derogatory comment. Uh, basically what we have to learn that we don't design systems for the 0.01% uh, of, of the people in the world in academia and research centers who understand a lot of security policies and they are very, very smart. We are really talking about the rest of 99.99%. And we, we are not doing well in that area. And consequently, in order to do better, we have to sort of pay attention to this. And in fact, it turns out that one of the corollaries here is that the coarser grain and the more uniform the policies are, the better, are, better off we are because people can learn those relatively easily. So the second axiom is related to the first one. What's our maximum expectation about users? What can we expect maximally? And the thing that we should expect maximally is that the users should know how to separate their assets. So they should distinguish between assets and non-assets. And if users cannot do that, then basically the whole thing is lost. But users actually can do that. They know that that they have to be relatively careful with what they do with their bank accounts, investment accounts, and you know, from now on, possibly healthcare accounts. And in fact, uh, what you what you don't see here is deliberately placed. We don't really have much interest in, but in defense and intelligence, people know how to separate assets. And when they don't, uh, there is trouble. Uh, and so once people understand how where their significant assets are, then everything else is free. It's wild. Uh, we accept in those areas whatever usable security the market provides for free, or almost for free. So, so essentially, if, if that's all we uh, can expect of the users, what kind of systems, the question is what kinds of systems do we define to <coughs> match that expectation. <coughs> okay, the last one is that the users do have a minimum expectations for us in security, namely that we should give them feasible recourse after security breaches. So essentially what this entails, and this is the main argument uh, of, of the last part of the talk, that what that entails is that we have to provide uh, accountability and recovery not accountability for recovery or recovery for accountability. These are two separate things. And also that we should be able to confine the effect of security breaches. So if users can recover from security uh, feasibly uh, and they can hold people accountable, then users will in fact feel a lot happier than they do now. Okay, so with that in mind, what did past architectures do for us? There's not much. So we started out with virtual machines in the late 60s and early 70s, and by the late 80s, people figured out that virtual machines and virtualization is good for security. Uh, but before we got there, there was VM370 that essentially partitioned resources in uh, virtual memory storage, virtual processors, and virtual I.O. And uh, each machine was given one of these partitions, so you have the operating systems here, and this could be different operating systems, which ran applications and if we are lucky, you've got a system designer who separate these administrative areas from these virtual machines. And it turns out that in VM370, there is not a notion of user-oriented uh, separation. So there was no, no way to separate assets from non-assets. Primarily, I mean, at least one reason for that is that uh, communication between virtual machines and application was broken, sometimes deliberately, in very ad hoc ways. So that separation was not really there. Secondly, <coughs> there, was not, there was no way for, for the user to figure out which virtual machine the screen action represented. In other words, you can start in a virtual machine, and if you get malware, uh, that could switch it to a different virtual machine, to a look alike, and you wouldn't know about it. So you couldn't tell 
that watch a song that's kind of what, what you really expected. Uh, and there are these very fast unauthorized switches that basically gave you no idea where you are. In fact, this is a, a, a problem which was pointed out by uh, a joint project, IBM System Development Corporation, about 1973, where the question was, okay, the, the system authenticates me. Well, how do I authenticate the system? How do I know what part of the system am I talking to? So that gave uh, rise to the notion of trusted path. Anyway, uh, application <coughs> security, simplicity policy, none, none of that was supported. Uh, credible assurances for the virtual machine, virtual machine monitor. The virtual machine monitor is really a very large piece of code uh, that uh, sometimes gets larger and larger. So what did we do better now in virtualization? So what does then do, for example, and what does VMware do? Well, <coughs> at least they got something right over the years. Namely, okay, uh, you cannot really, separation is not really user-oriented, but the communication between virtual machines and through them application is much more controlled. And you have some degree of access policy in communication. So essentially here, the, uh, you have virtual storage and virtual processes or processors, uh, and communication is uniform, it can be controlled, and much of the IO is done in the root domain, which is a humongous piece of code, probably about 10, 10 million lines of code. But this part is much smaller. How much smaller? Well, not a lot smaller, it turns out. Uh, for uh, You have roughly, for Zen, around 160,000 lines of code to 650,000 lines of code for Hyper-V. And in domain, root domain, you have 10 million lines of code and 14 million lines of code. Of course, this root domain is part of the trusted area, unfortunately. So the assurances are still impractical, but the point is not so much the assurances, separation is not user-oriented. Uh, very briefly, <coughs> security kernels uh, never really help the user all that much, although they're wonderful architectural devices that system designers could use. So remember we had the reference <coughs> monitor, which is supposed to be isolated, tamp I mean, tamper-proof or isolated, uh, non-circumventable and small enough to be verifiable. Then if you had this, you could build, you could support subsystems that have their own reference monitors as you go towards the application. For example, DBMSs have their own reference monitors because they actually use different types of objects and different kinds of subjects. You have transactions as subjects, which are not just processes, but processes equipped with recovery and <coughs> um, And you had the objects were actually tuples. So you had a different reference monitor, but it all, all based ultimately on the lower one. Yet if you look at this structure, which is used by a number of systems in uh, the 80s, uh, <coughs> there was not much here for the human user. It was mostly oriented towards structuring the system for assurances. And we didn't do so well because assurances require stability. And these systems are never stable. They grow. This grows. This grows. The mail system grows. Uh, applications grow. Could you give an example yeah. of what you mean by there's not much there for the user? Well, so basically, uh, the, the user sees uh, a system that has some degree of assurance, presumably triggered by the structuring. But there is nothing for the user. There is no way for the user to separate assets, for example. Okay. Uh, so there were there are no user-oriented policies. There are wonderful policies based on, say, access control lists mm -hmm. and role-based access control. But ultimately, uh, those were more system structuring and application structuring policies as opposed to human-oriented. I just want to understand. So you're not suggesting it was just missing some nice human-computer interface. The problem is no. Structurally, it wasn't built with That's you correct. have to manipulate it the way he right. things. So the topic, my topic is sort of the architecture side of the yeah. for the client was a user in mind. Okay, so I'm not, by the way, I think these were great architectures, but they never really caught on uh, because the minute you obtain the assurances, which is years after you develop the system, the technology moved on. So you produce an obsolete system, unfortunately. Okay, so now what do you do in practice? So one idea was proposed by Lamson, 
in 2005, uh, re-emphasized in communications of the ACM in November 2009, which essentially says this, split the world into two parts, and no more than two, namely a red machine and the green machine. And the green machine is not that it has a lot more assurances than what we're used to, but it's a lot better configured than presumably maintained by professionals for you, okay? So it's all updated. Your virus <laughs> tables and virus scanners are updated, and it's under strict configuration. <coughs> you cannot really download software on it at will, okay? On the other hand, the, the other world is the red world that we live in nowadays, in which you can be free and wild. This is the internet world. And if you know how to separate assets, then you communicate with your banks and your investment firms and use your healthcare through always through the uh, green machine and not through the red machine. And that separation can actually be enforced to such an extent that your green machine and red machine can communicate only via network protocols that gives you stream of bytes. And that has a little bit of a problem because you don't really get rich objects and you don't really uh, exploit all the facilities. But if you communicate only through streams of bytes, then presumably the threat decreases. So somewhat uh, facetiously, we remember that this is exactly what goes on in the intelligence area in the military. The intelligence soldiers in Iraq are carrying two laptops, right? One is connected to the uh, secret <coughs> network, basically a cipernet, and the other one is a nippernet, which has access even to the internet, right? So they have to carry it. Now, physically, this is a little bit of a problem because it's very difficult to fit three soldiers in a uh, in a Humvee with six laptops. I mean, it gets ra rather crowded. So essentially, uh, the remaining problem after you've done this, after you make this usable in some way, and we'll see later that it can be made, is communication between red and green. You need what used to be called Checkpoint Charlie East-West Berlin, right? So the East was red, the West was green, but somehow you have to communicate. You have to accept input from red, and you have to be careful with the output into red. You don't want to disclose too much, okay? So the question is, how do you do that? Uh, there is no checkpoint, Charlie, here. Okay, so let's make the, the physical partitioning into a logical partitioning. Uh, so basically, the way you try to do it, at least the way we try to do it, <laughs> is to actually build a very small hypervisor that does partitioning, not virtualization. Or if you do virtualization, it's purely for partitioning reasons. And essentially, the way you can tell, the way you can uh, produce attestation that this hypervisor code is untouched and is pristine on that piece of hardware, you have an external verifier, which is a USB-like device that has this red and green lights and the button. So. What this does, as you turn it on, it does attestation on the hypervisor. And then you, as a user, press the button and you switch from red to green or from green to red. There is no other way to switch between these two machines. This is as, almost as good as physical partitioning. Right? So, so malware in green, I mean malware in red, cannot switch you from, to, the, to green or the other way around just not possible because unless you push the button, uh, you cannot switch. But there is still the problem of trustworthy communication. So we built a prototype. This is a very small hypervisor. We're talking about less than 7,000 lines of code. So yeah. But you're assuming somehow then that, that um, you always remain in a state where green is green and red is red. So I'm actually assuming, and I, I in fact, I was going to say that, uh, and I'm, I'm happy you are pointing out. I'm actually assuming away all the problems of communication. Okay. Right? So right now, I'm, I'm viewing the world very simply. One, is, one dimension is this partitioning, which I'm satisfying through this hypervisor. And I'll show you one more version of it. And the second dimension, which I have not touched yet, is this 
communication that may actually switch my world and may in fact cause problems. Okay. Okay? So I'm reducing the entire problem of trustworthiness to two dimensions, separation or isolation if you want, and trustworthy communication. And the claim that I make is that there isn't that much in between. Okay, all right, so, uh, so basically what we, we did this, again, partitioning based on Lamson's initial idea, we found additional reasons to do it. And then we found that there are reasons to actually produce a second type of partitioning, namely one uh, which would allow us to separate pieces of red and declare them green, and also pieces of green that will be greener than green. <laughs> Why? Well, imagine that we are talking about communication within a green partition. This is a very closed network between you, your bank, your investment houses, your healthcare provider, with very tight configuration control. Basically, you don't download software at will, among other reasons. But what happens is, you are going to download and communicate with competing parties. Therefore, you have to make sure, among other things, that you maintain your credentials, different type of credentials for different parties. So for example, one of the things that you want to do, you want to make sure that you protect your, simply, your secret key from the parties you are communicating, right? Who basically will download their client side on your machine. Right? So a bank tells you, here is my client side, install it, and you'll talk to me, for example. So you have to make sure that the client side doesn't do too many bad things to you and to other client sides. So basically, you, you do some partitioning inside your applications, inside your operating systems. And to do that, to do this code and data partitioning and, and verify interfaces here, um, you also would need to have some hypervisor code. I, se I show it separately. Uh, and again, uh, we experimented with this in this paper called Trustvisor, which was presented at Oakland uh, in last year, last May. And again, this separation is uh, done, the physical, I mean, the partitioning is done by this verifier. Okay, one more thing about this uh, architecture is as follows. So once again, I want to point out we haven't solved the communication problem yet. So one more thing about this architecture that you really want to establish what's called trusted path to be able to communicate with this pieces of application logic that are protected and isolated. In other words, you want to make sure when you're looking at the user screen that actually the communication is between you here, your input device, and this piece of application logic on either side, or this piece of application logic and your this device, your monitor, which is a lot harder. And this device now helps you in that area. It helps you tell whether or not, say you are in this part, it helps you tell whether or not you are really activating trusted path or not. So you know that when you are typing, no amount of malware can control this communication. Now, this is not entirely trivial. This is a piece of very fine engineering because your I.O. with your device has to be done here, not there. Otherwise, your hypervisor blows up. We are still trying to have hypervisors roughly under 10,000 lines of code or 12,000 lines of code. Why? Because we are hoping that the complexity <coughs> becomes manageable and we can do some real <coughs> proofs such as proofs of se separate address spaces, proofs of separate permissions in, in, in those areas. This is what my colleague Anupam Data does, is to actually uh, try to do proofs on properties of hypervisors. OK, so with this, uh, we are more or less in an area where we'd like to be. Users can separate worlds into the green and, and the red, and we can give the user some degree of control over switching and some degree of control over <coughs> credential protection. So that's the partitioning world, two types of partitions. Okay, yeah? So what happens when, say, a user thinks they're going to a banking site, 
actually run a bad site and they download something onto the brain partition. Okay, so again, you, you are talking about this area. You, this banking side, the green side, is a closed system. Imagine a distributed system that has a closed population where you actually download very little <coughs> software. You download it very infrequently, namely when the banking side said, look, we have establishing a client uh, provider relationship and that's it, right? So it may very well be that the banking side will download badware here, uh, but it's not that often. They are much better managed than your client side machine. Uh, so now, if you are now talking about being in red uh, and and accepting input from red, that's a totally different problem that I have not addressed yet in this talk so far, but I'm going to. So how do you bootstrap then? So you're assuming that you bootstrapped into the correct banking site and they are well managed, hence your green portion. No, no, no. I don't bootstrap. I'm, I bootstrap in the system. I switched. I switched into green. And this tells me with whatever assurance you want that I'm in green. I activate trusted path. And trusted path tells me that I'm talking to only the client side that I chose. All these client side pieces are actually registered with the hypervisor. So there is no DNS. Now, what about, are you using DNS here? I mean, if you're using DNS, for example, you're likely to be in very serious trouble. You don't. The green side has the configured IP addresses of your site without using DNS. DNS doesn't exist here, right? So again, this is a very controlled environment, which you use very infrequently. How often do you go to your bank or your investment bank or your retirement fund? or your healthcare compared to being here very frequently. And that's the idea is that, well, that's an unfortunate thing of security. So security is almost synonymous with inconvenience, right? What we try to do here is to make inconvenience as uh, rare as possible, right? And, and most of the time you can be free and wild. So did I address your question to some extent? So again, you know, there is no, no way to resolve to something else because this is strictly controlled. Identities of whatever you register is maintained in the highest privacy because there aren't that many. Uh, naming is already resolved. Yeah, I guess um, I'm still thinking that ultimately the green OS is also most likely vulnerable to um, you know all kinds of attacks, and and so in the end, even the green, the green system is vulnerable. So I, I, I mean, I know you're you're saying that. that was my question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's clearly vulnerable through through this, but this is what my emphasis of this presentation is. There's two dimensions. We can solve one of them, but what about the second one? And the second one, in my opinion, is much harder than the first one. And that's where I want to go. Remember, I told you the last 15 minutes is where the action is. This is just a head fake. <laughs> so this is engineering. It's really there is research here. There is good stuff in formal verification. But conceptually, we more or less know how to do it. It's just a great deal of work. Right? So I'm not claiming that you are invulnerable here. In fact, my point is that you are vulnerable even in green after you've d done this because you haven't taken care of this. Okay. All right. So now we are getting to the, the more interesting part, namely the last 15 minutes. What I consider more interesting, I don't know about you. But basically, we know how to do red-green separation. We can even separate dimensions on a more finer basis, on a finer basis, but... Uh, the argument is that you shouldn't. Uh, and basically, we have to focus on what's called uh, trusted communication, which is past secure crypto channels and past trusted paths. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, two things. How do you accept foreign input? And how do you control the dissemination of output? So let's just go over to see how conceptually we do that. Input. Uh, so basically, Limesense says all trust is local. 
it is you, the acceptor input, who has the final decision to accept or reject. So would you accept ASCII or Unicode? Well, maybe Unicode, yes, maybe ASCII, you don't know. Would you accept PDS, PDF? Of course, PDF is active code, and so is DOC, PPT, and uh, Excel. Java and other scripts, would you accept any of this? Well, we normally do. So it would be interesting, by the way, as a side, uh, side comment, to have a secure PDF that has proven code, proven benign code, which is not so easy. Then we can map everything to it. But be that as it may, how do you accept this? Well, so the first question is, can input be always verified? <clears throat> when I mean always, I mean always. And the answer is obviously not, because the input could be arbitrary code. And the output behavior of arbitrary code uh, leads to undecidability. And I'm sure Steve teaches you about that <laughs> in his theory <laughs> courses, <laughs> right? OK, so the answer is no. Well, you may say, but come on, this is just theory. Well, can, if the input, whenever it can be verified, is verification always efficient? OK, because, well, we can separate the world, verifiable and non-verifiable. And if we focus on the verifiable, it's always efficient, problem done. And the answer is not likely, because, for example, the input may be a solution to a problem which is coin P complete, which essentially means that you, the provider of that solution, solve the problem in polynomial time, and I, the verifier of the solution, solve it in, I mean, verify the solution in exponential time, most likely. That doesn't make sense, right? I mean, obviously, I cannot possibly verify your solutions. I cannot possibly verify the input that you send me efficiently. Well, possibly, likely. I mean, we know the difference between uh, MP and CoMP, and uh, it's unlikely that we'll be able to verify this efficiently. So now we know that verification, when possible, might not be always efficient. And what about practical? Well. Sometimes I can verify the solutions that you send me. Say I outsource a computation to the cloud, meaning I outsource the program to the cloud. Can I always verify the results of that program? This is different from the previous problem, because in the previous problem, I didn't send you the solution, the code of the solution. You had the code. Now I'm sending you the code in the cloud. I say, please run it and send me the solutions. Turns out that this is always possible to verify. In fact, there is a paper at Crypto in 2010 by uh, Gennaro and uh, Gentry and Parno, and that's basically Brian Parno's thesis, which actually shows that you can take a uh, <laughs> function represented as a circuit. And what he did, he shows that unlike uh, Yao circuit, which you can basically garble only once, he can uh, reuse the same garbling over and over again. Consequently, he gets linear efficiency in the size of the circuit. And he can verify the results of the outsourced computation, if he outsources it. But unfortunately, it requires, this requires homomorph fully homomorphic encryption. My sense is I couldn't solve this problem with Brian, so I, we had to invite Rosario, who is a reasonably good cryptographer, I would say exceptionally good. Uh, and he couldn't quite do it, and then Craig Gentry helped. And so, but all the time during this piece of research, I had the feeling that we might be able to do it without homomorphic encryption, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. But anyway, so they did it using this. Is that practical? Well, not always. <laughs> OK, so uh, how about, OK, so let's say that we resolved all those problems. Are these uh, the input verification problems always scalable? And the answer is no. Uh, basically, you do have solutions, classes of solutions to these problems. For example, multi-level integrity with Bybus model. Uh, Everything is labeled with integrity labels. All objects, all subjects, problem solved. You only accept input if the input has a higher integrity label than yours. 
and we always give output to integrity levels same I and mean, higher or input higher of the same, output the same or lower. Problem solved. Well, is this scalable? This is an integrity labeled closed world, input closed world. Okay? Not scalable. I mean, how many people use this? Very, very few. In fact, I know a couple of companies doing this and did this in the 80s, but at a very coarse level. An integrity label was not attached to an object, but to an entire computing center. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so then it was a closed world anyway. There is a single company. And then you also have the Clark Wilson model, which is also uh, a closed world, this application closed input. You only take input from very well controlled application. This is your green area. So what, what Dave Clark was talking about really was what we now call the green area. But certainly it doesn't scale to, to red. Okay. So you get input. What do we do nowadays? We always click accept, right? <laughs> so you get a self-signed certificate. What do you do with it? Well, how often do you say no? Well, you look at it and say yes. Okay, we shouldn't do that. So my answer is, and I'll tell you in a minute why, is that if input cannot be verified, which is very likely, you are in a trust world. Verification eliminates trust. If you can verify, you don't need the trust. If you cannot verify, you need the trust. So the question is, how do you trust? Well, you can trust, in my opinion, and this is the argument that I want to make in the next 10 minutes, you can trust only if you ultimately have accountability and recovery. Now I'm going to give you the, the theory behind it. Okay? So, uh, and by the way, in passing, I like to say that um, we do have um, uh, quite, quite a few pieces of research in accountability in cryptographic protocols. So this started out in 1995 with the, uh, a paper published at Oakland called Accountability in Electronic Commerce Protocol by Ratchek and Kyler. And the latest paper on this was done by uh, uh, Ralph Kusters at uh, CCS 2010. And Ralph covered a lot of the definitions of accountability in cryptographic protocols, very active area. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about accountability in the large. Okay, so here is a trust game, an optimistic trust game. And this was defined by Dan Ariely in a book called Predictably Rational. And it refers to some work done in uh, trust in economics and in uh, behavioral economics. So basically the idea is this. There is a dealer. And two anonymous players. The players don't know each other. And uh, they get an endowment from the dealer, $10 each. And now, the, basically, the game is this. If player one accepts to play the game and transfer his endowment to player two, the dealer triples that, adds $40 to player two, this simple transfer of $10 gets to be $40 to player two. And player two now gets $50, and he's supposed to send back half of it. This is one of the many versions of this game. So essentially, if this happens, then at the end of the game, both parties are better off. In other words, if player one trusts this anonymous party, doesn't know anything about it, gives it all his or her endowment. He ends up with $25 if this part is trustworthy. Of course, cannot be verified if this part is trustworthy. Why? This party can actually run away with the 50 bucks, in which case he is vulnerable. He lost. Okay. So rational economic theory says this game should not be played. You reach equilibrium if you stop after you get your endowment and make no other move, right? But basically, it turns out that most people playing this game ended up trusting the trustee, okay? So, and some of them lost. Now, what's the flip, so flip side of this trust business? Say I lost, what do I do? 
So uh, Ernst Fair, who is a noted uh, Austrian economist at the University of Zurich, uh, did a lot of work in uh, trust in economics and behavioral economics. And he uh, published a paper uh, with his group in 2004 in Science, which has a follow-on game to the trust game I just described. So basically says the dealer now gives $20 to player one who lost the $10, and $20 to, to player two, the anonymous guy. And now the dealer tells player one, if you pay me to punish this guy who really scammed you, I'm going to do the following thing. I'm going, for every dollar that you give me, I'm going to take $2 away from this guy, so I'm going to punish him. Uh, also, another part is, okay, free cost, free punishment. For every zero dollars you give me, I'm going to take $2. And I also have symbolic punishment. From every dollar you give me, I'm going to take zero dollars. So there is a cost of punishment, free punishment, and symbolic punishment. So what did he find? What did they find? So most player one paid the dealer to punish player two. Uh, roughly at the cost of $11, and the punishment was minus 22. And when the punishment was free, they punished more. That's expected, right? You want, you want to punish people who scammed you. Well, what he found is that punishment induced satisfaction in the user by doing a pet of the player one brains. <laughs> okay, so what was activated was this... Uh, striatum, dorsal striatum part of the brain, which is associated with reward satisfaction. So basically, punishment is very sweet of the miscreants. So what he found, he found that there was, in the trust game, betrayal aversion. In other words, aversion to being scammed and cheated. And this was biological, not psychological. And they called it altruistic punishment. So essentially, what they discovered was something very interesting. Uh, they discovered that old behavioral economic models did not have this component. Old models that people in security economics looked at were basically risk-type models, which did not differentiate who the cheater was. This cheater could be a machine. If this cheater is a machine, then all you have is risk aversion, but you don't have betrayal aversion. A machine cannot betray you. Turns out that the betrayal aversion component for the scam guy who accepted to play this, accepted bad input, if you want, and trusted that input, trusted to play the game, uh, betrayal aversion was more important a factor than risk aversion, which was studied very well by Kahneman and Sversky, and Kahneman got the Nobel Prize in 2002 for this kind of this line of work, which he and Versky initiated. And also, they discovered that there is a third component to trust, namely the belief in trustworthiness of others, which, by the way, could be increased by gift exchange games, as the economists call them, or like what we have reputation games in eBay and the rest. So essentially what they found is that there were three factors, and only three for behavioral trust, in trusting your input. Right? We can look at the mirror image, but we don't have the time now to put. I'll just mention it in a few words. But let's focus on input. Three uh, components. Risk preferences or risk aversion. That's basically the classical economics. And classical economic, economics says risk aversion, belief is another trustworthiness, earned reputation, reputation games, which presumably become more robust, and that's an active area of research, and social preferences, we, which we ignored completely. What this is, is that we actually have to have, for betrayal aversion, we have to have some deterrence mechanisms. And this is one of the points Lamson makes, right? He says, look, uh, you really need accountability. And Lamson says you need accountability because deterrence it requires punishment, and punishment requires accountability. So this is a line of reasoning by Lamson. Uh, 
He also says that accountability doesn't necessarily require identity all the time, but that's a second matter. And of course, accountability does not imply deterrence. And by the way, one of the things that he did not notice is that in order to have punishment, you actually have to have norms in these games. And there is a very recent paper, November 2010, by Robert Akalov, not George Akalov, but Robert Akalov, who you find his paper at Sloan, MIT Sloan, that talks about punishment, compliance, and anger, which basically shows the effectiveness of punishment and when it causes compliance or deterrence and when it doesn't. Again, that's behavioral economics as well that can tell us what kind of punishment causes deterrence. But generally, accountability does not cause deterrence. However, the point that I'm trying to make is that Lamson is right. This is a fundamental necessary component of deterrence. And deterrence is very necessary because we want to cover this area, not the risk aversion. Risk aversion is covered by something else, I argue. Lamson's argued that you need deterrence, and I was actually able to link it to this betrayal, betrayal aversion thing, and not I, or behavioral economist. Okay, what else? Well, one more component. We know that uh, there is research in belief enhancement, if you want, through reputation. Uh, but what about risk preferences? Well, so risk preferences, uh, just like social preferences or a betrayal aversion, cannot be really done with a game. They are external. I come with my risk preferences. But what the system can do for me can diminish my risk aversion by giving me feasible recovery. So if I know that I can always recover, I can press yes. So for example, I use a credit card. And in the US, my exposure is 50 bucks. <laughs> Right? Use your credit card, provided that the credit card that you use is not coupled with other elements of your identity that an adversary steals. But provided that is a reasonable protocol and you are talking about only input acceptance, if you use your credit card, your downside is limited. So what this shows is that if I provide feasible recovery, uh, then I can decrease the betrayal aversion and improve this notion of trust, improve trustworthiness. So I can improve trustworthiness by uh, reducing risk aversion by feasible recovery, reducing betrayal aversion by deterrence, and of course enhancing the trustworthiness in player two by uh, reputation protocols. And well, of course we have to make this robust because otherwise it's not going to help. So, uh, so my argument is that, oh, by the way, uh, as a parenthesis, recovery without moral hazard, right? Because if I, if I recover from everything, then I'm careless, right? So that's basically what we would miss in a financial industry. If this company is not that the US government and the European governments are going to, and now the Chinese government are going to bail them out, why should they not take risk? I mean, they'll be crazy not to take all the risk in the world. That's called moral hazard, uh, an instance of moral hazard. We don't want that to happen. So basically, feasible recovery uh, without causing moral hazard. So these are the components of input trust. OK, well, accountability research, lots of it, but not so much, not enough. Between 1995 and now. And we get all sorts of specialized accountability protocols over time. And the net point is that we need to look at the human-oriented aspects of input trust, the trust and gift exchange game for reputational building. And among other things, as a consequence, human-oriented accountability policies, right? Because that's the basis for terms. That means, do I always click yes on a signed certificate, self-signed certificate that I get? I would if I have accountability and recovery policies. So, so my, my point is that what we are able to do is to have some foundations for trust and trust components. And what we should do, we should work in these areas to provide computing mechanisms 
infrastructures or institutions in the internet that would enhance trust. Why? Because we also noticed, and this is a correlation, not a causality yet, we also noticed that improved trust in economics is correlated with higher GDP. So and I can give you 10 security reasons why that ought to be the case. The less constraints placed by security mechanisms, the better off you are, the less friction in economic transactions, right? So what that says is that our view of security, this fine-grained isolation and heavy-duty security mechanism, maybe are not so useful. Maybe what we should do is to do what Lamps and Origina suggested, provide deterrence and what I suggested, provide physical recovery. Uh, and the way to do that is to address these fundamental factors. Okay, so that's really the message that I want to send. And, and of course, uh, there is more to say about all sorts of other things like input compliance and you know, uh, output compliance and trustworthy output and originator control policies. You originate an output, you want to control what the recipient does with it. Digital rights management, which is an output, trustworthy output problem also. Traitor tracing, which is part of this. Memoryless subsystem, all these are part of the output version of the problem. But the output version of the problem fundamentally is not all that different from the input version of the problem, except that recovery becomes a lot harder, right? In other words, if I output something which is private or confidential, I don't get it back. So recovery requires other mechanisms, uh, such as possible the finer compartmentalization. But anyway, so the, the fundamental point is we really need to focus on trustworthy communication, given that we more or less know how to engineer this, more or less. What that means is that we know how to do this well in perhaps some very strict academic settings, but we really have a lot of engineering here to do and a lot of foundational work here. And that's really my message, the two dimensions. One is isolation and engineering, trustworthy spaces, and the other one is more communication, trustworthiness, or which should be based on some foundational ideas. And I found those foundational ideas in uh, behavioral economics and neuroeconomics. So now the question is, how, could, how, how does it happen? Last question. How does it happen that these guys who do behavioral security or economics, security economics, did not notice this? Well, it's not that they missed it. It's just that they obviously didn't. Uh, um, it's just that what they emphasized was really this. Uh, and to some extent this part, but they missed this betray betrayal aversion component. So very fine piece of work, which I always advertise, is Frank Stiano's work on what we can learn from social scams. The Real Hassle is a British TV program that shows a bunch of scams. So Frank and one of the producers of The Real Hassles wrote this technical report in 2009 in which they actually extract some of the interesting parameters of scams. Those parameters are more or less psychological. My interest is in modeling scams as possible composition of games, right? Then we can study mathematics of scams, uh, which I think is a rather exciting area. So I could actually point out some of this trust game and gift exchange game into some, some of uh, Frank's scams. And I think that would be a cool area to look into. So behavioral, I mean, uh, <coughs> security economics really found these risk preferences, and that's risk aversion, risk preferences. That's basically what <coughs> Frank is talking about. And we know that this is also being explored, robust reputation mechanisms. So we are making a lot of progress in that area. But what we don't know is when we are done. And from behavioral economics point of view, well, we are done only when we address all three. And to be done takes a lot of work, such as how do you provide accountability in the internet? Not in a simple crypto protocol only, although that's an exciting area of research as well. Okay. So let's thank the speaker. <laughs> and now let's take some questions. Comments. Comments.
it's just two minutes over, you should let people leave. Oh, yeah, yeah, if people have to get to the next place, yeah. then please feel free to do so. We're a little over time, but if you have time, please stay on. So I guess I'm thinking along the, okay. the lines of recovery. So essentially what you're saying is that um, to build a usable, secure system and to encourage people to actually engage in financial transactions and things like that. Without value transfer val transactions. Value transactions. Um, the user needs to have some assurance that there's a way to recover if something goes wrong. Feasible recovery. Feasible, Feasible. recourse, actually, because recourse may be not just recovery. It could be something else but feasible recourse. So is this kind of, I guess um, in some of my past work, we were trying to design a system that actually maybe is similar at, at, at some of the levels where if you're logging into a bank account, you want to signal whether you're in a trustworthy situation or an untrustworthy situation. For example, you could be at a kiosk, internet cafe, you just have to check if some transaction made it. But you don't want to give the kiosk owner your password. And so, we came up with this uh, very simple idea of like red password, green password, you know. Yeah. So if you log in with your red password, it signals to the other side that you are in um, an unsafe situation, so please restrict everything that I can do. Okay, but anyway, so we started thinking along these lines and we were thinking, well, you still can't, you can't, uh, I mean, the question is what can you do and cannot do in a, in a, in a, in this kind of a setting, in the when you use re reveal an untrustworthy setting from your side, and then we started thinking about um, transactions that are reversible. Right, there's things like you know, if an email gets sent out to somebody, you cannot recall it, but at the same time, maybe a financial transaction up to a point can be can be reversed. That's a perfect analogy, so, by the way, because uh, you know, uh, again, one of Lamson's point, which I quote and credit him for it all the time. You know what security is in banking? Most of it is recovery. Most of it is undo. Uh, that has worked reasonably well. But go ahead. No, I guess so. I, it's okay, just this so open-ended question that we don't, there are going to be some actions that are not, you cannot recover from, and there are some actions that can be easily reversed, un, can be undone. With the right, button. so the question is when you don't recover, yeah, what, what would you do about? If you are scammed, if there is accountability, then you don't recover inside the system, you try to recover outside the system, and that's still okay. But let me make a larger point. The larger point is that what we do in security, most of the time, we focus our attention on what I call isolation mechanism or verification mechanisms. In other words, if I can verify whatever you give me, or I can verify your behavior mm -hmm. or my output, I don't, there is no trust. Verification of input, in the input case, implies no trust, okay? which is basically showing that the Russian proverb is completely flawed in this area. And, and Ronald Reagan obviously didn't know what he was talking about in parroting it, right? So the Russian proverb apparently says that trust by verify. Well, if I can verify, I don't, I don't need the trust. There is nothing. There is no well, trust I, game. I, I, okay. <laughs> So, so we in security, to finish that, focused ex exclusively almost in the verification part. And that's okay. I mean, we, if we show that, that there is no trust, we win, right? If we, if we eliminate trust in most places, we win. And that's part of the work in cryptography and, and system security, and that's wonderful. The problem is, what do you do when you have the trust? You don't have a choice. And that's why I went through those problems where you don't always uh, verify the input. It's inefficient. It's impractical. It's not scalable. What do you do in those cases where you actually have to trust? What, where is the feasible recourse there? That's what this talk is all about. So if you need accountability, um, it seems to me it implies, in some sense, verifiability. Because your accountability system. So let's say you've got your red side and your green side, and you want changes on your green side to be accountable. But they assume you don't care what happens on the red side. But if I understood, like the, the whole point of this is that accountability should be one of the, the deterrents for the network communication between the two, right? So in the case the, that you know you have a full out attack on the green side and it's successful, 
then you've got no uh, logs okay. to, to reforce. You know, can to I reforce rephrase your question? Sure. <laughs> what do you do when accountability requires verifiability? How do you sure. provide accountability without well, verifiability? And actually, the, the point, a very subtle point that people missed over the years is that you have a bootstrapping problem. Namely, this is a brilliant example of uh, the argument that at some basic point in the system, you need some foundational verifiability mechanisms. Otherwise, you cannot build accountability and you cannot build recovery. Therefore, this high level trust, like human oriented trust, will not be enhanced because you, you won't be able to decrease the risk preferences or in, 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 uh, decrease betrayal aversion. Again, if you don't have these two, and these two may require some very basic verification or very basic isolation. So I'm not saying that those things should be ignored. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm arguing the other way. I'm arguing that you need those mechanisms to, to be able to do this. In fact, this is one of the reasons why I showed the red and green and the communication part. The only reason why we can focus on communication is because presumably we solve this by verification. Right. I guess my, my view is like what I'm looking at is red, the red side attacks through the network, the green side, and is successful. Yeah. And therefore, accountability needs some. Accountability isn't in this closed system you've described. Any accountability would have to be in the network itself. Right. I, and, that's, and that's. And how I, do you do that? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the economist called this. Uh, institutions, how to build the infrastructure of the institutions to provide accountability or to provide some degree of recovery to, to diminish risk aversion, although they are not too concerned with risk aversion as far as I can tell. But yes, you have to have the core of mechanism in the internet, the core institutions, if you want, in the internet to provide accountability. Uh, and, of course, to provide punishment based on norms and, of course, which would trigger deterrence as in, in Robert Takalov's paper. Um, and no question, you need, you need a core of verifiable mechanisms based on core notions. Maybe it could be complexity notions or it could but, be... Like, for instance, is anyone in Gini looking at building in an accountability framework to the network that could then be extended to yeah. the Well, there, are, there is, for example, we, uh, we namely a, people, a bunch of people at Carnegie Mellon published a paper on the accountable internet protocol that actually used an old idea, but reasonably good idea, where you actually have all the internet addresses be accountable because they're generated from public-private key pairs, which are registered somewhere. And all of a sudden, that simple piece of crypto with a little bit of security in the registration, a little bit of management glue, uh, would actually provide accountability for IP addresses only, not for the action of whoever uses IP address, but some low-level accountability. Yeah, so absolutely, you need fundamentally to build accountability, you need some isolation primitives and verification primitives. Uh, this is sort of part of the never-ending how do you go through Thanks, Excuse me again. I understand your thesis of your uh, talk is that the four um, more user-oriented um, accountabilities for is, uh, is the more most more close to humans' perception of the of the security and the building blocks of these are isolation verification. They are more kind of a system oriented. Is that the is, is this understanding correct? Uh, to to a large extent, yes. Um, so basically, the part of the system side of the human orientation, in my opinion, has to be extremely simple. Uh, it has to be just separation of assets. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you have separation of assets, that's the architecture part of the client side of the human. But beyond that, the more complex side is accepting input, mechanistic mm -hmm. accepting input, and also to enhance control over the output. There is a lot more human work there than separation. 
Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, let's let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.